So we are now ready for our next speaker for today, Dr. Jacqueline Nessie. Now, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behaviour at the Brown University. Uh, also in the US, in Rhode Island. Uh, and you're also a clinical psychologist at the Rhode Island Hospital. Jacqueline, I guess it's good morning to you too. Early morning. Yes, good morning. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome. And uh, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see my slides okay here? Yes, yes, it's very good. All right, great. Uh, well, thank you so much for, for inviting me here. Um, you know, and thank you, Nick, for that uh, really interesting presentation. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity today to uh, discuss the current landscape of research on adolescent mental health and social media use, um, including a bit of my own work. And um, to discuss some opportunities for intervention and change in this space. So my first few slides will reiterate a little bit of what Dr. Allen has said. Um, and so I'll go quickly through those and then I'll really try to focus my talk on uh, digging into some of the risks and benefits of adolescent social media use. But just briefly, um, Social media is, uh, can be thought of as really any digital tools that allow for social interaction. I have a longer definition here that I won't, uh, won't read through. This is from Carr and Hayes um, for later reference. Uh, but most of us kind of know about social media based on the sites that are most popular. So things like Facebook, which has billions of users worldwide, YouTube, TikTok. Um, and we know that social media use is nearly ubiquitous among adolescents. It's a, a key component of adolescents' lives. We also know that um, uh, as we heard in earlier presentations um, over this uh, summit, that one in seven adolescents have a mental disorder in the world. And that over the past 10 to 15 years, the rates of uh, mental disorders in many countries have increased. And of course, at the same time, the adoption of social media has risen. And you can see from this graph here, which where each line is a different social media site, um, just how exponential that rise has been. And as Dr. Allen said, the, the co-occurrence of these two trends has really led to some concern about potential links between the two. But taking together the full body of research, including recent uh, meta-analyses um, focused on depression and suicidal thoughts and behavior, you know, we really find that um, there are the associations between time spent on social media and mental health tend to be somewhat mixed, somewhat variable. And if they're significant, they tend to be small. Um, so where does that leave us? Does this mean that social media use is irrelevant to teens' mental health? Uh, of course not. Instead, I think these average effects mask really a number of important factors, all of which point to the really critical nature of social media in teens' mental health. So this includes uh, the fact that um, social media impacts different teens in different ways. Uh, some may be more vulnerable, vulnerable than others, as well as the fact that there are, of course, benefits and risks to using social media, depending on how it is used. Um, and I think by understanding these individual differences, as well as these risks and benefits, we can really identify opportunities to intervene and support youth in using social media in healthy ways. So two broad areas that I want to discuss when it comes to the impact of social media on teens' mental health. Uh, the first is social interactions, including, of course, both positive and negative social interactions online, as well as mental health content, meaning posts, photos, messages, information generally that specifically references mental health on social media, again, both positive and negative. Of course, the distinction between these two is somewhat artificial when it comes to social media, but I think it's a useful way to frame this conversation. So within each of these categories, social interaction and mental health con content, I wanna briefly mention how the features or kind of affordances of social media as a technology actually change some of these processes, I think in important ways. So for example, when social interaction happens online versus when it happens in person, it tends to be more public. There's a larger audience. 
Um, these interactions are available at any time uh, from any location, again, not limited by geography. There tends to be fewer interpersonal cues, things like tone of voice and facial expression, which can lead to online disinhibition, people saying and doing things they weren't, wouldn't normally um, in person, again, for good and for bad. And it tends to be what I called inescapable um, with something like bullying at the end of the day, if a teen comes home, um, the bullying can still take place outside of the school context really at any time. So now I just wanna talk um, about how um, these experiences on social media may create benefits or risks for teens mental health. And then I'll talk about what this tells us um, in terms of opportunities for intervention. So first thinking about the risks of social interactions on social media. One clear risk um, that we see is the presence of hate speech um, and racist language. So a recent survey nationally representative in the US from Common Sense Media suggests that almost 70% of US uh, youth of color report sometimes or often encountering racist content online. Another risk we run, we run into um, in terms of teens' mental health is uh, social comparison, um, which uh, tends to be facilitated by the online environment, as well as status seeking. So recent experimental work suggests that uh, in some cases, when teens receive fewer likes um, on their posts or photos, it can be linked to greater emotional distress. Interpersonal stress is also um, a key area of risk in this domain. So the most clear example of this is cyber victimization. Um, and there have various meta-analyses, including a recent one from my team, have suggested that cyber victimization is consistently linked with poor mental health, including suicidal thoughts and behaviors, depressive symptoms, um, as well as externalizing symptoms. And then throughout the rest of my talk, I'll give a few examples um, from my work. A lot of this is gonna focus more specifically on youth with um, experiences of suicidal thoughts or behavior, although many of the principles apply generally to youth with a range of mental health concerns. But I'll talk a little bit about data from a study I recently completed funded by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, AFSP. Um, these are youth recruited from a psychiatric hospital setting um, with significant mental health concerns. And the study included a number of measures, but I'll focus a bit on interviews, uh, which I'll provide some quotes from, um, as well as data collected directly from their social media pages. So this is one quote from a teen in the study, which speaks to interpersonal stress and cyber victimization online. So the teen talks about how on social media, um, people feel that they can hide sort of behind the screen um, and pick on you. She also talks about how social media can be more hurtful than in-person bullying, because when it happens on social media, um, she says it's posted everywhere. It's everywhere. So really speaking to this public aspect. Now thinking about some of the benefits of social media when it comes to social interaction. The most clear benefit here, I think, is, of course, social connection, which in the US, um, statistics from Pew suggest that 81% of teens say that social media allows them um, to be more connected to friends. We also know that social support is critical for youth with mental health concerns um, and that youth with mental health concerns are more likely to engage in this support seeking online. Um, online only friends or friends who have never been met in person um, is another aspect of social media use. Um, we know that youth with mental health concerns are more likely, again, to have online only friends. And we also know that youth who may not have as supportive a community of peers in their offline lives, such as sexual and gender minority youth, also may be more likely to have online only friends who may provide that support. And then just briefly to demonstrate the, the benefits uh, of online only friends, this comes from a study from my colleagues and I led by Maya Massing Schaefer at UNC, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, this is in a sample of 600 adolescents recruited from the community. And in this sample, we found that generally uh, youth who had been relationally victimized offline uh, were more likely to experience suicidal ideation one year later, except if they had at least one online only friend. So online only friends were providing some sort of protection, some benefit to these youth, perhaps in the form of social support. 
So now thinking about these risks and benefits of social interaction online, I want to think about opportunities. How can we intervene to encourage youth to use social media in healthy ways? When I say we, I think it's important to note that we're talking here about you know, various stakeholders, um, clinicians, educators, legislators, um, social media companies, teens themselves. Um, so first, I think we can educate youth through media literacy type programs and other ways uh, about the prevalence of hate speech and bullying. We can teach them about the harms of engaging in these behaviors. We can teach them perspective taking skills, um, remind them that what they say online in many cases is permanent, um, provide that education. We can also empower youth, um, giving them tools to cope when they encounter this type of interaction online and teach them to intervene when they see cyberbullying occur. We can also guide youth, and particularly this can be done in the design of social media platforms themselves. We can guide your youth towards social connection, perhaps towards more messaging type activities, these positive aspects of social media, rather than driving uh, social comparison towards likes and views and status indicators. So the second category that I'll talk about, as I mentioned, is uh, mental health content. Um, so this is information about mental health available online. Uh, the offline equivalent would be, you know, exposure to discussion or information about mental health just in the in the real world. And so online, I think the difference between how this happens online versus in person is so much in the scale. So there's just so much more content online, um, unlimited really resources and information, but also of course, access to more harmful content. Um, it's also easily accessible, um, accessible immediately at any point. Um, it can be privately accessed, um, of course comes from a variety of sources. Um, and because social media tends to be driven as well by algorithms that are personalized to the user, this type of content can be directly targeted to the user, again, for, I think, positive and negative. So here we'll start a little bit with the benefits. So there are some amazing benefits, of course, to social media here. It's just so many resources available. It's easily accessible. Um, this comes from um, uh, the Origin group led by Joe Robinson in Australia. Um, uh, it's a campaign called Chat Safe, uh, which uh, has been working towards suicide prevention in the country and now offers resources worldwide. We know that social media can also be an opportunity for stigma reduction. Um, this comes from uh, uh, a post or a hashtag that was popular for Mental Health Awareness Month around breaking the stigma. We also see opportunities for self-expression among teens, um, for teens who may be going through difficulties, and opportunities for intervention in many cases. If this might be one way that we're able to identify teens who are struggling by their posts or their messaging on social media. And I'll just share this one quote from a 12-year-old female, again, which set, speaks to this sense of, of um, maybe stigma reduction online, you know, knowing that she's not alone in her struggles with mental health. She says, it's nice to know, you know, that I'm not the only one. And now I'll just present two slides uh, discussing the, the risks of certain mental health content on social media. So the first is, difficulties with verifying information and, and exposure to misinformation. So this comes from TikTok. Um, this is what happens if you search for the hashtag TikTok therapist. Um, as of when I last looked, it had 461 million views. So clearly there's a need for this type of content. Um, but of course, some of these posts may be from actual therapists or mental health professionals. Many of them are not. Many of them are from influencers, um, even friends of a teen. And so it can be hard for teens to really evaluate where the truth lies in some of this content. We also know there's some evidence that exposure to content that depicts risky behaviors, whether that's substance uh, use, uh, dangerous behaviors through things like TikTok challenges, um, may increase risk for engaging in these behaviors. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about suicide-related content. So this is, you know, posts and photos and messages that relate somehow to suicide or self-injury. Um, and this chart comes from a study that I recently conducted. This was with um, uh, almost 600 
psychiatrically hospitalized teens. And, and in that group, I just want to point out uh, one number here, which is that about a quarter of these teens reported that they had viewed content related to self-injury online. Um, and so this isn't, this isn't a small number, particularly among vulnerable youth. And then I just wanna provide a quick example as well of what this type of content might look like on social media. This has all been edited slightly to protect um, participant confidentiality, but this type of post um, was shared by a teen in the study I described earlier. Um, they post this on, on social media um, uh, with a photo and of course describing, um, describing thoughts about suicide. Um, they described that this was actually on a vent account uh, which is a specific Instagram account that they created as a way to kind of share how they're feeling. And then I have two quotes here that talk about how teens view some of this content online. Um, so this first, um, first adolescent talk, um, I think potential for sort of normalization kind of processes that may take place when it comes to suicide related content online and particularly in particular, she says, you know, I won't post this type of stuff, but other people in my school do. Um, some people think it's cool to do that. They think, um, they think of it as a trend. She says, I think they like the attention. Um, but then another teen, and I like this quote because I think it really speaks to the challenge here and, and to the dichotomy of what we see with these type of posts, which is, you know, she says, I feel like it's said often that people are looking for attention when they post this kind of thing, um, but it's not always a bad thing. You know, why would you post something like this if you didn't want help? Um, and that really, I think, is the struggle here, is how do we identify when teens are posting this as a way to look for help? Um, and how can we balance the possibility for sort of normalization, maybe contagion in some cases, versus the need um, for support? So in terms of opportunities that I think this, this speaks to um, or how we can intervene. Uh, first, I think, you know, again, we can educate you. So this maybe again through media literacy type efforts on how to determine the accuracy of the content that they're viewing online, how to identify misinformation, um, uh, how to verify the sources of the things that they're viewing. We can empower youth to slow down when they use social media. I think they can, we often uh, hear teens describe social media use as mindless, um, but they can use social media in more mindful ways. And we can teach them to do that, to take a second, to think for themselves, when is this content helpful for me? When is it harmful? And in what moments is that true? And we can guide youth again with the help of social media companies and design of products themselves, guide them towards more of these helpful resources, helpful information and true content um, and away from some of the more harmful content. So briefly, just a few key takeaways. Uh, social media, of course, is nearly ubiquitous among teens. Um, it's not going away, it's going to stay. And so we know that it presents both benefits and risks for adolescents' mental health. In order to maximize the opportunities that teens have with using social media, we really need collaboration among these, uh, these key stakeholders that I mentioned. Um, and in doing so, I think we do have an opportunity to help you take advantage of these benefits of social media while really minimizing the risks. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline, so much. Uh, just a quick question. When you, uh, you talk about the different uh, parts of society that we, uh, all, all of those um, different parts need to work together, uh, how about the parents? What's the most important, maybe this is a big question, but if you can answer it quite <laughs> shortly, yeah. what's the most important thing to do as a parent? Yeah, I think that that is a, a really important question here. And I'll say just, just briefly, I think that um, for a parent, I think it really comes down to open communication. So I think that uh, parents really want to be encouraging their, um, their teens to talk to them about what's going on online. Um, and so that sometimes that means really taking a, a non-judgmental stance when it comes to your teens' online activities. Um, to be open when they come and share difficulties that they're having online. 
um, I think it's critical that that the the conversation remains remains open. Mm. Thank you. I, I know this is a big topic, so we can maybe come back to it. But thank you so much for now, and uh, please stay on.